Hello, everyone. Welcome, episode 16. <laughs> In our last session, episode 15, uh, we talked to uh, many of you about this amazing, amazing topic, and that was commit to five. Commit to five, five things we can do to empower the leader within us. And the top three takeaways from that episode were be productive, not busy. Be outcomes based and accountability drives success. For all of you that missed that session, all of the sessions leading up to 16 are visible for you to watch on warrenrustan.com. So I hope and encourage you to do so. So I wanted to step back for a minute. And as you recall in our very first session uh, that we had in this series of, of episodes, I believe it was the first week of March, uh, we were facing lockdown, um, shelter in place. And Warren was talking about gearing up for us being in this potentially a two year process. And here we are. He talked about preparing ourselves to be involved as long as this takes. And he talked about and encouraged us to continue to prepare, to continue to be vigilant and to continue to really spend time with our families, our businesses and beyond. Because as you know, this is a really challenging time. We're 15 episodes in, 15 episodes, <laughs> thousands of views and engagement. It's been amazing. And we move into the next phase, the eve of Warren's book, The Leader Within Us. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> Stand by. He's going to challenge us to lead. So in today's session, Warren is going to be talking about the challenge to lead, to empower the leader within us. COVID-19 has changed the world in so many ways, which will require new ways of thinking and leading for the reordered world ahead. So a big thank you to you. Thank you for all of your, your engagement over the last 16. It's been amazing. It's been a pleasure to host these with Warren. But it's been about you and about us and our togetherness and our, us thinking about how we're gonna continue to stay together through this because we are here for each other. And you know, each week, my favorite part of every week is introducing Warren. <laughs> And for those of you that have seen Warren and, and, and know Warren, uh, the in introduction's really, really simple, right? You, someone says, here's Warren, he walks up on stage and that's it. He needs no introduction. But for those of you that have not met Warren or seen Warren, I'll tell you a little bit about him. So Warren is former CEO of Providence Service Corporation. He served as member of the board of directors for over 50 public, private and not-for-profit companies. Warren served as appointment secretary to President Ford. He's global was global chairman of WPO, um, secretary, um, dean of faculty at the Entrepreneurs Organization, EO Leadership Academy. I had the opportunity to attend. Amazing. Countless awards, Sports Hall of Fame, White House Fellow. But the award that Warren treasures the most is Father of the Year in his hometown of Tucson, Arizona. And if you know anything about Warren, you know about his dedication to family. And we heard that just a few sessions ago. Just a reminder, this is a conversation. Um, all of these episodes, again, are available on this Facebook page, but also on warrenrustan.com. And of course, you can also find these on YouTube on Warren Rustan's YouTube page. I'm so excited about this episode. Thank you again for being here. Here's Warren. Welcome to today's conversation. I expect a dialogue today. I suspect there will be several questions that will be asked, several comments that you want to make. Please do so in the chat box. We appreciate that. This is the 16th time that I've had the opportunity to stand before you in this camera and to talk about issues of importance, issues that can change our lives, things that we need to be thinking about to prepare for our future. And today is no exception. The notion of the challenge to lead. And the question before us is, 
will leadership be the same post pandemic as it was pre pandemic? We know that our leadership has changed a bit during the pandemic over the last eight months since February 1st until today, eight months has transpired. And you recall as Winnie suggested in her opening that in the first week of March, many thought this would be a few weeks to a few months. And I suggested that our family at least was going to hunker down for at least two years. Our belief that this is a long haul, a long change process, and a long time to find solutions to this very difficult virus. And so we're eight months into it and we have a long ways to go. And so it's maybe important that we pause for a moment to start thinking about our future. And what will that future like be like from a leadership perspective? Almost all of us on the phone and all of us on Zoom, all of us who are interacting are experiencing leadership in one form or another. We lead in our families, we lead in our businesses, we lead in our communities, and of course we lead ourselves. But we have to ask ourselves over this eight months, what has changed in our lives? What has changed in your life in the last eight months? I would offer and submit everything. Everything has changed. It is amazing how quickly we adapt, but if we think back just nine months ago to January 1st, and we think about where we were then and where we are today, I would make the argument that everything has changed. And because everything has changed as we look to the future and we think about a post-pandemic world, a post-COVID-19 world, what does that look like? What's that going to be like? Well, let me suggest a few things and then let's talk about some of the skills that are going to be required in leadership that may be slightly different than they are now. And then let's talk about some mega trends that seem to be emerging from the pandemic that may alter the world ahead in such a way that we have to change our leadership style to some degree to accommodate that new world. So first, what's that world going to look like? Well, first I would say it's going to be unknown. It's going to be uncertain and that a lack of certainty about the future is going to be pronounced. It's going to be significant. There are going to be many more unknowns post virus than there are pre virus. Because you think back, we had the financial crisis in 2008 and nine, and then the world recovered pretty well. Economies were booming. They were going pretty well overall. And then 2020 arrived, the new decade arrived and the pand pandemic came upon us. And so as we go post pandemic, what we're going to see is uncertainty and the unknowns are going to be significant. The second thing I think that we're going to see are these mega trends that are beginning to emerge. There'll be many of them. I'm just going to suggest 10 today, but there are going to be many of them that impact our lives directly, impact our businesses directly. And if we're going to be leading in this post pandemic era, then we need to think about different skills, different kinds of approaches to the way we do things. I think attitudes will be different. So the third thing is attitudes, attitudes about how we live, attitudes about how we buy, how we travel, attitudes about our families. I think attitudes will change and therefore the nature of leadership may have to change slightly as well. In some cases, it'll change dramatically. In other cases, it'll be more nuanced and subtle, but that's important. And then finally, I wanna to suggest to you that there's going to be a high demand for soft skills in leadership and less of a demand for hard skills. And so let's talk about that a little bit. What do I mean by that? Soft skills are those ways in which we relate and socialize with people and communicate with people. So let me suggest some of the soft skills that I think are going to be important. First is the ability to listen. We actually had part of a session on listening just a few weeks ago but the notion of the ability to listen coupled with the ability to ask the right questions and to be a questioner, to allow inquiry to be a part of our personality and the way we do things. So listening is the first. The second is empathy. I believe in the world going forward, we must be much more empathetic for the plight of others, for those who exist with us in the world and what they're going through. And while we'll never be able to stand in their shoes, we need to be able to listen carefully and be empathetic to where they're going and what they're doing and how they're thinking about the world and the pain and the suffering or the excitement and good times that they're having. 
and be joyful in that understanding of other people's circumstances. There's nothing more that has highlighted that than the social unrest and civil unrest that we're seeing in various cities around the world. There are people that need to be listened to and we need to hear their story. So empathy, our ability to understand them is going to be important. How we communicate, the very essence and nature of how we communicate with each other, the words we use, the phrases we use, the understanding of the importance of language and how that communicate affects the attitude of that communication becomes critically important for us as we lead post virus. We can practice those skills and those soft skills now while we're in the virus, but they're going to be pronounced and important as we exit the other side, whenever that may happen. The other is carrying this presence of gratitude and being grateful consciously, openly, with language of gratefulness on a regular basis to those around us, to be grateful for all that we have. And the one thing that we should have learned or are learning from the pandemic is that we need to be grateful for the world we had prior to and the world we can create post. But what we're in right now has constrained us and taken some of our freedoms away that we're accustomed to on a daily basis. And so we need to be grateful for that which we have. I think also there's going to be an increased emphasis on humility. And even though we live in sort of a narcissistic, individualistic, social media driven world, I think there's going to be much more emphasis on people with humility. The pandemic should have taught us humility, that that which we've created can be taken from us really quickly, that the world of materiality is not the world of consequence. It's the world of love and kindness and tenderness and relationships. It's the world of spouses and significant others and partners. It's the world of children. It's the world of relating to each other. That humility should be brought to bear on us during the pandemic because we have lost much. There's been great pain that's been suffered and there's been great dislocation that has occurred. And so we have to be recognizing that each of us needs to be more humble, less self-promotional, less self-driven in that way. So let's think about that. I think another important soft skill is going to be empowerment. Bill Gates said the leaders of the next generation will be judged by their ability to create empowerment. The notion that we can help other people and we can give them the right to succeed or fail. We can give them the tools and opportunities they need to be successful, right? It's the ability to empower others and let them run, let them go. Our ability to create that environment of empowerment is going to be an essential skill in a post-virus environment. So empowerment becomes critical. Another is the notion that there's going to be a higher degree of collaboration and consensus needed within businesses, families, and communities. This notion of bringing people together to commonly determine courses of action, to commonly determine where we're going. Yes, there will always be a a place for leaders who advocate, but there's going to be a great emphasis on inquiry as well, allowing people to self-discover, find out for themselves, and then take charge of their path and their direction within a given environment. So our ability to empower becomes essential. And finally, I would suggest to you that this notion of self-awareness that we discussed many sessions ago needs to be heightened. Think often and daily about who we are how we communicate, how we listen, get rid of our judgment of other people, embrace other people, bring them to us through kindness and generosity. Be aware of our environment and the circumstances within which we live for they are, they are forever changing and they will forever be changing, but only at an accelerated pace. So if we think about those soft skills that I just mentioned and how we apply them going forward, what are the trends that could influence how we lead in that situation? Now, I had a conversation with a good friend of mine in India, Nyan Shah, and we were talking about the megatrends that begin to emerge, the kinds of things that can influence our businesses, yes, and even our families, and certainly our communities, and how we lead. Soft skills versus hard skills, what are the combinations, and the delicate nature in which we have to use them as leaders. Well, here are some trends that are obvious to many and some that may be less obvious. First, for example, direct to consumer. 
prior to the virus, there was sort of 20 to 25 to 30 percent of all purchases were made direct to consumer. But since the virus, that number, maybe 60, 70, 80 percent, almost everything we have purchased during the virus has been direct to consumer. So one of the great trends going forward is the, is the expansion of direct to consumer. Many of the people who are now used to accustomed to over the last few months ordering direct will continue to do that. So it has huge impacts on commercial space, retail businesses, um, real estate, the whole scheme of how things are brought to the consumer is going to change. And indeed, we may find that some of the facilitators who occupy space in the middle between the production and manufacture of product and the consumer's consumption of that product may in fact be eliminated. Is your business one of those businesses that's in the middle, that's in the center, that is a facilitator of products? And will that change? Car dealerships, for example, we can day, today shop online, pick out the uh, particular features that we want on our car, the color of our car, everything about it. We can price it online it can be delivered to our home. We never have to set foot in a car dealership. Will car dealerships change? Will they become service centers? Will they be different? That's an example of a facilitator, right? A middle person. So let's think about that. A second major trend I think is gonna be telemedicine. I think in the future, far few of us will sit in a waiting room waiting to see a doctor. I think much of the diagnosis for the most mundane and simple things are going to be done over Zoom calls using social media to do that. We'll, we'll see a doctor on a screen and he'll make his recommendations. Now, there'll always be a need for specialists and we'll need to go see certain specialists. But how we get there, scheduling our appointments, arriving on time, diagnostic kinds of things, forms to fill out, everything will be done in social media. We'll have far less interaction with our doctors than we've had in the past, directly one-on-one, -on -one, face to face. Telemedicine's been around for 30 years. We've used it before. I've been in the healthcare business and we've used it in, in uh, both the physical health and behavioral health side, mental health side. But it's gonna become much more dominant, particularly from a family physician perspective and doing the more routine things. And so telemedicine will emerge. Online education, we've already seen that. Schools across the world are teaching using social media tools again. There are far fewer students in the classroom today than there were a year ago today. And there will be fewer students going back to school. It's estimated of the hundreds of millions of students there are around the world that in fact, 20 to 25% of them will probably never go back into a classroom. They'll continue with online learning. That dramatically changes the need for numbers of teachers the kind of subject matter that gets taught, how it gets taught, grading systems and so forth, content, the development of content, presentation of content, all of that stuff begins to change. The fourth is online work, and that's obvious because of the virus, people went to their homes and they worked from their homes. Far fewer people were seen in corporate offices and those who were were socially distanced, wearing masks. And what we're finding is that there are many corporations who believe now that major segments of their workforce can work from home or from a remote office, not from a corporate center. Now, clearly there are those kinds of businesses where you have to have people in a specific location to do the business. Manufacturing is a classic example, making cars, making airplanes. People are going to have to show up. They're going to have to be on production lines. We understand that. But there's a great amount of work that can be done using social science, use social media. And so we're going to see much more of that. In fact, a good friend of mine, Alfredo Melnick, who has a, has a company in uh, Mexico City, and he employs about 500 people, has decided to sell his office. He's going to rent a small executive office space for those people who will need a place to go to work. Not everyone can work from home because of children's online education, because of spouses or partners that are also working online. So home is not always the best solution for everyone. But in Alfredo's case, he did a survey of his people and 80% didn't want to come back to the office. 80% would like to work from home. And that's going to be true. More and more times we're going to see that kind of trend. And it has implications for other things. It has implications for where we work. So proximity to work becomes less important. 
heretofore people have lived in a place where they could go to the corporate center to work so they could go on a bus or a train or drive. They could commute. But there'd be far fewer commuters. There'll be far fewer people moving to large corporate centers or corporate offices where thousands of people are employed. And they'll be working as a distributed workforce. And so where we live becomes less important. My wife and I just took a trip up through the Rocky Mountains of the U.S., small towns, back roads. We got to talk to a lot of people, including some real estate people who say the phone is ringing off the hook from people who are leaving major urban areas on the east and west coast of the United States trying to find smaller places to live, more rural places to live. Why? Because they have the Internet. They can still do their work with the Internet. So as long as they have a good connection, they can live where they want to live. So proximity to work is not something that's going to be as critical going forward. It has huge implications, huge implications for the way the economy is driven. And we know from friends who are leaving major cities in the U.S., in Europe and other places to find better confines to live, more interesting places to live. There will be supply chain disruption. In the past, we've always said the manufacturer of raw material, which gets shipped to manufacturing centers, which then gets built and the product gets shipped to distribution centers, distribution centers, move it to retail outlets and wholesale outlets and so forth. Are we going to see a disruption of the supply chain where raw materials gets moved directly to 3D printing, for example, or gets moved into local environments and then consumers can order direct or it goes to a retail outlet just to be picked up? Are there disruptions in the supply chain that we're going to see that affect you potentially and your business and what you're doing? And how does that manifest itself? And what kind of leadership is going to be required to make these changes and to adapt and adjust? It's going to require soft skills and the skills that we mentioned just a few minutes ago. As we see people not having to move to city centers, for example, the core and downtown areas of major metropolitan areas and urban areas around the world may begin to change. And so the suburban areas or the small outlying areas around major urban areas, what we call suburbs, may become the villages of tomorrow. They may become smaller city centers where you go for your groceries and you go for automotive repair or you go for any number of things, community activities. But those suburban areas and suburbs may in fact become the villages of the future. Interesting to think about. We're entering a time of mass personalization and customization. A time when we can go online and have products designed just for us and then get shipped directly to us without enter any intermediary. That middle process, that facilitator that we talked about. I can design my clothes online, have them sent to me directly, exact specifications for my body. We've been able to do that for a while. It'll become more pronounced in the future. Many more situations like that will develop in the future. Does that create opportunity for you? Is there economics that you need to be thinking about? Are there new businesses, new ideas that you should be thinking about? So we're going to see this mass customization, mass personalization of products across the globe in all societies. I think the other thing we have to think about as it relates to leadership is that most governments around the world at the local province, state, federal level are actually insolvent. They have insufficient resources to meet the contractual obligations and the mandated obligations which they have undertaken. Pension benefits, retirement benefits, different kinds of things that have been promised to people, infrastructure, roads, bridges. We have a decaying world because much of this was built and developed in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Governments don't have the necessary resources to actually provide the money to fix all the things. And it starts at the personal level, at the city level, at the state or province level, and then at the federal level. The only way to reconcile that for a government is to increase taxes. And so we will probably see inherently increased taxes at all levels of all governments going forward. And we will see that there will be substantially new taxes for all citizens as we go forward. 
So the insolvency of governments is going to be a major, major trend and problem as we go forward. And finally, I think governments will, in their inherent willingness and desire to make citizens feel good about their government, will try to flatten the wage disparity. Because what we have today is significant differences between the haves and the have-nots in the world, between those who are marginalized and those who are wealthy. And that gap continues to increase. So governments in their desire to flatten that wage disparity to bring it closer will start to create stipends to be given to every citizen. And when that happens, that comes from increased taxes again. But the, but the ability to flatten the wage disparity over time philosophically and easily um, is going to be difficult and challenging. But it's something that governments will try to do. So as we think about developing soft skills, as they apply to these major trends, and there will be other trends, and I may be right or wrong, I'm just saying that these are things that we look at and talk about, that these are things that we have to consider. These are things that are really important to us, and we need to be understanding about what they are. Because there's going to be an acceleration of change and transformation in the world, because we now have greater technology than ever. If you think about the three great movements over the last couple of 200 years, first of all, we were built and developed on an agrarian agricultural society. And then we moved into the industrial revolution. And then we moved into the information-based society. And now we're going to move into artificial intelligence and all that it brings to us, coupled with the sophistication of today's technology. It's an extension of it. And so we're really in a new era and we'll feel that even more post-virus. And so I hope that you're preparing, you're thinking about those many things that become important. I hope that you're aware that they will touch our lives. They'll change the nature of our leadership. They'll also have impact in our families, certainly in our businesses, but in our communities as well. And we're going to help to help our communities actively change and communities are slow to change. And finally, the impacts that it's going to have on us directly and how we think about the world. The challenge to leadership and the challenge to lead going forward is going to be different. We have to prepare for that. It's our obligation to do that. Now, as we think about the previous 15 episodes that we've had, I was ruminating about that the other day, thinking, I can't believe this is the 16th episode. I can't believe we're having this conversation for the 16th time. But I began to think about what are those other episodes that we've had that are consistent in their themes as we go through this important process. And I'll ask Winnie to put them up on the screen so we can look at them together. But it's this notion that we've covered a lot of topics, all of which have application to the future of what we're trying to do. All of them have application to our important businesses that we're thinking about. So you recall the very first session we had, we talked about the crisis. We talked about COVID, we talked about the virus, we talked about what it means and how to get our arms around it, how to dimensionalize it, how to conceptualize it. The next was we talked about the fundamental principle of our lives, right? It's the clarity of vision that we have to have for our life, whether it's family, business, community, or self. We just have to have clear view of where we're going, of our purpose. Then we talked about intent, certainty of intent. The notion that once we know where we're going, we can act on it every day intentionally. It will get us there if we do so. We talked about the power of values, the notion that through transparency, vulnerability, honesty, our integrity, through the very essence of who we are, we travel on this journey together. And people judge us by that. We talked about the five principles then that follow that, that are everyday applications of the first three, clarity of vision, certainty of intent, and the power of values. The first is commit to a higher level of discipline. We just have to be more disciplined in everything that we do if we want to achieve our goals and objectives. Following after that is we have to live with purpose every day. Define our purpose each day when we get out of bed and then live to that purpose during that day. Take it one day at a time. The next is act with intent on that purpose each day, all day. And we get more things done. We become more successful. And then following that, of course, is make choices. Make great choices and make conscious choices. Don't just get swept along with things, 
but make choices that are tied to your intent, that are tied to your purpose, tied to your vision. Finally, engage in a cause that's greater than self. The notion is that we're not on planet Earth alone. It's not just about us. This is the humility I talked about a, a bit ago. It's the notion that we have to serve others. We have to give to others. We're better because we give with others. If we're having a bad day, go serve someone who's having a worse day and we'll feel that we're okay. We talked about five leadership qualities that really work, that if we use them every day, that we in fact will get better at everything we do and have more success. Then we talked about resilience, the ability to overcome adversity, challenge, difficulty, pain, suffering, hardship. It's our ability to overcome and never give in to the difficulties of life because we all have them. We've all had failure. We've all had mistakes that we've made. We've all had misjudgments. No one is immune from that. We talked about exponential impact, the very thing that's happening in the world today. The world is moving at an ever increasing rate, faster and faster. Can we keep pace? And are you improving your leadership at an exponential rate? If you want to have a company that becomes exponential in its growth, you have to be an exponential leader. Are you that leader? And then we brought it to, let's talk about family. How about some simple ideas that make family life a lot better, more exciting, more fun, and teach critical skills and teach leadership to your children. So we talked about that. And that session was a lot of fun. And then we talked about commit to five last week's session that if we can get ourselves, our teams, even our family to commit to doing five significant things every week, the five most important things that have to get done that week, think of the progress we'll make, but we get sucked into doing what's urgent, not what's important. So commit to the five important things that you have to get done this week. And when you do that, your progress accelerates. And then today I want to talk about the challenge to lead, because I think the challenge to lead in a post-virus environment will be significantly different than the one we have today. So I want to thank you for being willing to listen to me, my ideas and my thoughts. I hope it's helpful to you. I hope somewhere along the way you've gathered a single idea that you're going to implement that will change your life. For that, I'll be happy. I'll be joyful. That's great. Now, let's entertain some questions. Uh, Winnie, if you have some questions, I'd be glad to respond to them. Great. Thank you, Warren. And uh, for all of you that have asked, please, please tell me what the top 10 trends are. We'll transcribe those and we'll post them to this page today. So make sure that you have those. That was amazing. Thank you, Warren. So I want to go back to episode one months ago, uh, the crisis we're in. And um, your comment on one of the takeaways was refocus the mind and change the mindset from what is to what will be, how do we do that, Warren? Yeah, I think it takes dedicated effort every day to do that, but it's critically important because our mind drives everything, right? It's the control center. And so it's the captain of the ship. So what our mind thinks about is who we are. As we think, so we will be. Shakespeare said that many years ago, right? As we think, so we will be. So our thoughts drive our actions. And so I'd suggest several quick things that you can do. One, meditate. Think deeply about yourself, about the world, about your family, about who you are and what you want and how you're going to get there. So that's one. Two, focused strategy every day in your business. Block out a time every day in your schedule where you close your door, turn off your devices and think deeply about your business and where it's going and how you're going to get there. You can do the same thing about your community. You can do the same thing about your family. Thirdly, create time and space for yourself to focus your mind and change your mindset in the way that you need to, to be successful going forward. If you just get caught up in doing stuff all day and don't take the time to reflect on who you are and develop your self-awareness about the environment within which you live, you will have a difficult time. It will, you will struggle, right? We all go through periods like that. And we're in one right now. This doggone pandemic is hard. It's blown up businesses, right? People who had successful businesses on January 1st today don't have businesses, are out of work, don't have cash flow, and are out of jobs. There is pain and suffering in the world today. 
And you and I as leaders have to step up to help others. Focus your mind, change your mindset. Thank you. And which leads me to alignment, right? Which was episode 10, weathering the storm. Um, and you talked about, you spent a lot of time talking about the alignment of mind, body, and soul. Yes. What do we need to be thinking about? I think we can get there through meditation and time and space, right? But this is notion of aligning our hearts with our minds, with our bodies. I believe that as human beings, we start from the heart. We don't start from the mind. We start from the heart, from our passion, from our love, from our tenderness, from our kindness. That then dictates and drives how we think about things and how we apply those great attributes to others. And so create that alignment. Be sure that you're centered and that you're not out of center. All of us do at different times. We just, we move left or we move right or we make mistakes or we, you know, and we don't do things exactly as we know they should be done, but work hard at creating the alignment between heart, mind, and body. And your soul comes with that, mm -hmm. right? Your soul just comes with that. When you get that alignment, your soul is alive because you're doing the right things for the right reasons. And when we get there, and it takes some of us a long time to figure that out, but when we get there, it's a wonderful place to be. Mm. Yeah. When you talk about heart, uh, one of the best things I like about my name, um, I really think about Warren, just your heart, you know, and, and, and what you've given to the thousands of, of viewers that have just had access to your content, your leadership, and how much you've impacted them, not only them, but their, their families, their companies, and even their community. So uh, just another opportunity to say, thank you. And I, I know I speak for everyone. So thank you, Warren. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. We feel it. I feel it. Um, and what a gift. Thank you. Um, so episode five, uh, commit to a higher level of discipline. And again, everybody, you can see all of these episodes, warrenrestown.com. They're there for you to view. And Warren would love your feedback uh, on the Facebook page. In, 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 in the session, when you talked about um, committing to a higher level of discipline, Warren, you talked about, in the, I love this statement, and I'd like you to help support me on what this statement means. And that statement is, the world is changed by those who do and those who are disciplined. Well, I think that's right. I mean, I think that there are lots of people who feel things, who have good intentions, but never actually act on those good intentions. And so those intentions are for naught. It doesn't matter, right? It's wonderful that we have thoughts of good intention. I give you credit for that. But the fact is that the world is changed by those who act, those who do, right? Those are the game changers. Those are the world changers. And in our worlds, our individual small worlds, we can be that person. You know, the two kinds of people that when they wake up in the morning, they both have the intent of working out in the morning and being physically fit. One purchase person reaches over and hits the snooze button and doesn't get out of bed. The other person bounds out of bed, puts on their workout clothes and goes and do what they said. Now, they're both good choices. That's okay. There's no good or bad here. But the person, the only person who understands what it is to stay in shape and get in shape is the person who gets up and does it. It's not the person who thinks about it. It's not the person who delays it. And so this notion of doing is very important. I was raised by a dad who was a doer. He's the hardest working man I've ever met. I've tried to emulate that. I try to work hard. I eliminate the word try. I work hard. And we can do many things that we don't think we're capable of doing. But we'll never know unless we try. So Warren, um, well, I'm going to ask two more questions. Okay. One, the, the next one is really about episode eight, which is what you're talking about, about you're making conscious choices, right? Not hitting the snooze button is a conscious choice. Yeah. And you talked about in that episode that, but by making those conscious choices that we can really simplify and focus our lives. How does this become a simplification process and what benefit do we receive from that? Yeah, I think the simplification process is, is sort of how we train our mind to create that simplification process, to make it simple. Uh, for example, a, a child acts out. We come home, we're tired, we're frustrated. One of our children is acting out. At that precise moment, we have the chance to make a choice about how we're gonna react in that situation. We can make it simple. Hug, kiss, love, 
instruct, guide, teach, or we can spank, or we can get angry, or we can say things that we later regret that we have to apologize for. I think there are a whole bunch of choices that we make because of our mindset that are really important. And I think we need to be doing that on a regular basis. And so it's, again, this mindset. If I had to say there are two things in leadership, uh, the two words that are critical for great leadership, one is mindset and the second is discipline. Those two work together to create greatness. And you need to have one and the other to make them both work, right? Mm -hmm. Because a great mindset with no discipline doesn't help you any. Great mm -hmm. discipline with a wrong mindset doesn't help you any. So if we can get our mind right and then discipline ourselves to act on that, then the opportunities are remarkable what we can do. So I think we can simplify everything. I don't think life is nearly as complex as we like to make it sometimes. As human beings, we like to get caught up in complexity because it makes us feel more important. But the life, life is really simple. Do the right things for the right reasons, right? Make simple choices. And so I think that that is available to us, even though we sometimes want to make complex things out of it. Thank you. So this episode is, is titled Challenge to Lead. And one of the things that I've learned from you in these 16 episodes is that there is a leader within every single one of us, the leader within us. Can you tell us how do we uncover, discover, and bring that leader out into today's environment? Sometimes it's circumstantial. We may not think we're a leader, but sometimes events conspire to drive us to leadership and we get called upon to lead in a particular way and we do so. And we're forever grateful for that because, uh, you know, it, it gave us a chance to do something we didn't think we were capable of doing. That happened to me in high school where somebody called on me to lead and I didn't think I was a leader. And by having that experience, by accepting that challenge, I became a bit of a leader. And over time, I've evolved as the leader, as we all do. So circumstances sometimes. Other times, we determine to lead. We decide to be great. Jim Collins talks about that in his book, Good to Great, where he says that leadership and greatness is not a circumstance. It's discipline and choice. We decide to be great. We decide to be exceptional. And then we discipline ourselves to do that. So we put our mindset right, and then we use discipline to execute what our mind wants. And so that notion is that it can be, again, quite simple, right? So each of us has this leader within, and each of us has the opportunity to allow it to break out in different circumstances, in different times in our lives. Some become leaders really early and are leaders their whole life. Some people don't become leaders until much later in life. It is all circumstantially dependent, but each of us has that leader within us. Each of us has greatness within us. Greatness not based on others, greatness based on ourselves. Success is relevant only when measured against one's own potential. Success is relevant only when measured against one's own potential. Don't compare yourself to others. Don't get caught up in the comparison game. You never win. Somebody will always be better. Someone will have a bigger house, more athletic skills, prettier, thinner, whatever it is. But what are you doing with your life? What are you doing to be the best human being you can be? What are you doing to raise your game to the next level? What are you doing to prepare yourself for a post-COVID environment where the world has changed? Thank you for spending time. I greatly appreciate your friendship. Thank you for enduring the 16 broadcasts and podcasts that we've had has been fun, not podcasts, but episodes. And I'm just so grateful to Winnie for shepherding us through this and ushering us through this in a way that makes sense for all of us. She's delightful. She's talented. She's wonderful. And she has alignment of heart, mind, body, and soul. And she's someone I greatly admire. So Winnie, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you, my good friends who have listened in. I appreciate it.